What's up, guys? Welcome to Law Explaining the Interwebs. I am your host, Nick Riccada of Riccada Law, a small law firm in central Minnesota. And today we're carrying on the On the Nature of Free Speech series with a discussion about the idea that it's just a business making a business decision to do business with whomever it wants, right? So let's get some ground things out of the way first. Yes, a private business preventing your speech is not the same as the government and is, for now, sort of, not under the ambit of First Amendment protection, right? So if you are silenced by a corporation, yes, everyone on the internet can re 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 about how it's not a violation of the First Amendment because it's not the government doing it. It's just a private business. You can just choose to do business somewhere else. You can just choose to build your own platform. You can just do all of these things that the person who's not being silenced uh, can conveniently tell you, okay? So yes, for now, we'll accept that premise. It's not quite true, but in most situations, it, uh, it is passable enough. So we're going to take that. We're going to take it for now and say, yes, when Twitter bans you from, uh, from Twitter, that's a business decision of a private entity just exercising its rights. And uh, you can just go do your business elsewhere. That's not the government censoring you. So it's not a violation of the First Amendment. But that's not really the question, is it? It's not just about the First Amendment, because the First Amendment, one, only applies in the United States or within the jurisdiction of the United States. But let's not get technical here. Two is only just over 200 years old, right? 1791, the adoption of the Bill of Rights, is when the First Amendment started to take place. And actually, it's even younger than that in a weird way, because it wasn't applied to the states individually until about the 1870s at the earliest. I'm not even sure when the first case was, but it's following Reconstruction after the Civil War when the Bill of Rights started to be applied to the states through the 14th Amendment, okay? So First Amendment protection is only 140 years old for most situations as we understand it today, but that's not that's not the question. The question is whether it's a violation of the principle of free speech. And this series of videos is about properly zeroing free speech so that as we infringe upon free speech, and we're going to, we don't have free speech, we won't. We won't ever have total freedom. It, it, it can't really happen. That's not a moral condemnation. That's a reality. But the question is, where are we setting the zero to measure infringement? And if we set it properly, then we can work hard to keep all infringements to the minimum. So it's important to start with the absolute, the ideal, the principle of free speech that saying anything is acceptable and cannot be stopped and that there can be no consequence to it. No consequence that would make you change what you would otherwise say. That's the principle, the pinnacle of free speech. All right. We won't have it. That's fine. Not advocating for it, but that's where it starts. So then as we make these infringements and encroachments, we're always starting from zero here and moving across to figure out where we end up. And we make that choice as a collective society. OK, this is not the First Amendment. The First Amendment prevents government from actions. This is a principle of free speech that we need to collectively decide how we operate under this principle. OK, so that's out of the way. 
right now we've got businesses silencing people and it goes higher than someone being banned from Twitter or Alex Jones being deplatformed from just about everywhere. Um, we've got to first look back at the history of communication. OK, real quickly, think about when all this stuff was set into motion, when our legal constitutional framework was built was back in the late 1700s. And I mean, there are principles that predate that. But at the time, you didn't have much mass media. You, there was no mass voice. Um, you would have a few major newspapers that would have distribution beyond simply a couple mile radius. But for the most part, you had small papers acting all over and, and working with uh, various um, messenger services that literally sent people on horses town to town to get the news. And as it came back, you know, they could report on it. But it wasn't until the advent of the telegraph, the telephone, uh, these devices that things were communicated in any way other than by delivered letter carried by horse uh, or on foot. We're talking um, days to go miles, kind of like the way the U.S. Postal Service still works. But that's a different discussion. So only now, only now does everyone have access to speak to the world in a moment. That's so new in history that it's it's not contemplated by things like the First Amendment. Uh, so the, the principle of freedom of speech under the First Amendment is limited to government, one, because it's restricting government. That's what the, the entire purpose of the Constitution is, is to empower and restrict government in various ways. But in two, because the government was the only entity that had the power to prevent your speech from being spoken and therefore heard because they could jail you because everybody's level of ability to speak was to go into a public place, stand up on a, a raised platform and yell and hope to attract a crowd. I mean, sure, you could publish things. You could publish pamphlets or, or books or get published in newspapers, but that's not the every person. Now, the every person has a global platform and anyone can attract a crowd. Anyone. A high schooler, a, a middle schooler, anybody can go online, make a tweet or a post or something. It can go viral and reach millions of people. Never in history has this been uh, the, in the power of, or in the hands of the, the common man. Okay. But that makes the censorship of larger corporations all the more impactful because, you know, Twitter isn't just the ability to communicate with the world. It's also the ability to communicate with our close knit, uh, people. Um, are, you know, your, your personal friends are likely followers or friends with you on Twitter or Facebook or, or these other platforms. And so to shut down, uh, someone's Twitter or Facebook account is to shut down their ability to speak with their friends, their family, their government. Um, and, and then of course the larger aspects are communities, our states, our countries, and then of course the world, right? This this has never been a possibility in human history, and that's important to remember because the freedom of speech has been a value that predates all of this. And that, that value, that value, not just the First Amendment protection, that value transcends and, and the, the First Amendment is derivative of that applied to government, but it goes beyond that concept. So now we have these corporations that not only have the ability to hear everything you say, that's new too, right? Like you're broadcasting it out and now you can be heard by people who aren't otherwise listening, right? In 1770, the guy standing up and advocating against British control on the, on the corner can then go to the next town where the where the grocer couldn't hear his speech because he was busy running his grocery store. 
and that guy can buy buy things and that grocer may be British loyalist or he may just want to not cause trouble and not sell to a seditionist, right? So he couldn't hear the speech. Uh, he couldn't gauge whether or not he should do business. The person walked in, transacted business with him for all he knew he was fine. Now, not only do we have the power to communicate to everybody, but these large companies have the power to listen to everyone. And that's only going to grow as well. So right now, yeah, you've got Twitter and Facebook shutting people down. But think about this. If we go down this road where we allow private corporations to shut people down based on speech, we have different examples of this that are happening right now. We have financial transaction processors not allowing lending companies uh, not allowing financial transactions to process with, say, a gun manufacturer. So we've got gun manufacturers or gun advocates uh, not being allowed banking services because the banking services, quote unquote, don't want to endorse gun culture or whatever. Whatever their motivation may be, that's just a, them free exercising their, their right to associate and do business with whomever they want right? But how far do you want that to go? Because let's take away the gun. Now let's say that the major financial transaction processors, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover, let's say they all just decide on their own without any communication that, um, that if you want to go to a store and use their financial transaction processing uh, software and hardware, because the stores are bar are renting those machines, okay? Uh, those those machines are part of an agreement to use the services, and the service fee pays the rental. What very this is unimportant. Let's say that Mastercard decides. That uh, if you want to buy something using the MasterCard payment processing system, then they're going to require, politely, that the person you're transacting with, like the, the store that you're at, the retail front that you're at, have a contactless little pad there. And that if you want to choose to do business with them, you got to set your phone on there and hit scan and let it scan your social media to see if you maybe have said anything that they would find racist or sexist or, or homophobic, for example, in the past 30 days. And if you want to buy groceries, you'll, you'll just have to consent to that because your other option, of course, is to go do business somewhere else. I mean, never mind that these four financial transaction companies control the financial transactions of, of pretty much every business on earth. And their control extends much farther than just the retailers that you deal with. Because you could always use cash, right? Well, maybe maybe MasterCard doesn't want, you know, the, the store to even take cash payments. Because MasterCard also works with the banks. Like if you get a debit card from your bank, right? You go to Wells Fargo and get a debit card. That'll have be a Visa card or a MasterCard, depending on your financial institution. So maybe they go to the banks and say, I'm sorry, but if you want to transact with us and you also want to transact with the grocer as he comes in to do a deposit of cash into your bank, then we're going to need to require, we're going to need you to politely request, not require, require such a mean word, to politely request that the grocer scan the social media of everybody and make sure, you know, we're going to, we're going to set out a list of words and phrases and dog whistles and things to look for that the algorithms in our software will do. The scan will only take a moment. It'll only take a moment to scan the last 30 days of posts and tweets and, and uh, private conversations that you've made. They're not going to keep the content of your private conversations. Of course, they're just going to scan it real quick, right? Just the machine, the machine will do it looking for various things. And if, I mean, we know the conversations are private from everybody else, but if you want to do business with us, we want to make sure we're not doing it 
with someone who says something that's opposed to our company's values and that might compromise the image of the company by doing business with them, right? How far do you want it to go? How far do you want it to go? And what will you say when you can't buy food? When you can't buy uh, drinks, you can't buy water, you can't buy gas. Because, well, I'm sorry, we scanned your tweets and 28 days ago, it sure looks like you said something that might have been a little bit homophobic. You can go through our appeals process. Uh, it, it takes four to six days because there are just so many appeals coming through. And we don't have the staff to really uh, catch all of them as fast as we'd like to, but you can appeal it and we'll have a person look at it. Uh, of course, you'll have to consent to have that person look at your private conversation before it was just a machine and we'll need an extra level of consent from you because we've now got a person who might remember things even though our machines don't record it. How far do you want it to go? How loud do you want to re and say it's just a private business making a private transaction with another private entity, either you or a business? And if you don't want to do it, you can just go elsewhere. You can just build up another... And just build up your own payment processing system. Except when the banks won't let you use the banking system. Or MasterCard won't let you use the payment system. Or uh, Comcast won't let you use the internet connection to process your own payments on the payment system. Except when that happens. But then, then you can just build your own internet, right? How far do you want it to go? Free speech transcends the First Amendment. Free speech needs to be protected now. And all of the laws around this stuff, all of the restrictions on these large companies were written over a decade ago, before even MySpace. Think about it. Stop defending companies silencing people.